So John chapter 3, grab your Bibles, and we're going to be starting in verse 22 here. And John, we're going to be introducing Jesus going into sort of a different new phase of ministry. And instead of me explaining, let's just read what it is. Verse 22. It says, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came to the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. So we have the change of scenery, so to speak, Jesus and his disciples moved from the area of Jerusalem out into the area of Judea surrounding Jerusalem. That's where, in Jerusalem is where he went in and cleansed the temple right before Passover, cleaned out his father's house that was become a den of thieves, if you guys remember that. Then he met in Jerusalem. We assume, it didn't go specific, but we assume he met in Jerusalem with Nicodemus. And now he's coming out of Jerusalem, he's going into the area of Judea, and he's beginning a different, like I said, sort of phase at the beginning of his ministry, still really uh, in the beginning. Um, And what he does here is an interesting thing. He came with his disciples to baptize. Now, there was already a ministry there at the Jordan River, baptizing, but Jesus and his disciples... I don't know. In my mind, I don't believe he pulled up right next to him, said, hey, guys, we're going to do the same thing you're doing. But somewhere along the same river in the same area, the same region, Jesus and his disciples are doing the same ministry that John and his disciples are doing. So this kind of just right off the bat throws an interesting dynamic, an interesting thing. I never had this happen yet. You know, we've been kind of doing the music, the worship night in the park It would just be so odd if across the little valley at Green Valley Park, another worship team came and set up shop and put all their stuff up. I'd be going, wait a second, you're too close. What's happening? Why are you doing this? Why didn't we communicate? What's going on here? And so we kind of see the humanity of what's going on. We'll get to that here in just a second. But I get a few questions that come to my mind as they're doing this ministry is, First of all, I'm, I'm not sure. Is the, is the ministry exactly the same, identical? All we can say is it's very, very similar. And I would say probably even more similar than you think. John's baptism. What was he baptism, baptizing unto? Repentance. He's saying the kingdom of God is ha- at hand, and he was baptizing into repentance. And if they wanted to repent, no matter who it was, uh, John would baptize them, and they would they would be involved in the ministry that John was doing. Now, Jesus, we, get, we gather this, that early in his ministry from Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, he was doing a very similar thing. In fact, he preached. If you, if you want to, you can jot that down or turn there and look at it. But it, he says the same words. He says, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so we don't get that he's saying that at this scene of baptism, but he was saying that early in his ministry. But it's very similar. Very similar thing. And at the same time, interesting. Now, before we get into this scene getting even more interesting with the dialogue, I want to call our attention back to a little idea from verse 23 that I think is very important. It's a simple, practical idea. And it's this. John did his ministry at, at Anon. Why? Very simple reason, very simple answer. It's because there was a lot of water there, right? I guess this could be a deep answer, pun intended. But he's, he's doing his ministry in a place simply because there's a lot of water. Now, when I think of the, the saying, right, that there's a lot of water there, in my mind, I don't think that there's more water in this section than there would be in this section. It could have something to do with the depth there. But in my mind, I think of the ministry that he was doing, and that probably it entailed something along the lines of some more beachfront, where he had more room to minister, where people, the crowds could come in and he would minister to them. And so he ministers to this place or in this place where it was just a practical place to minister. Very practical. 
kind of gives us a, a, a very simple answer to a, another question, and the question is, where do I do ministry? How, how do we know when or where to do ministry? Well, I would say this. We could go like John did wherever there is a great opportunity or room to minister, right? And sometimes you could look at it and flip that around and say, well, I'll minister where there's a need, where there's an opportunity, where there's a place to minister. Regardless of, of how we do, I would say this, at the minimum, we should be praying for and looking for a place to minister according to, and this is important too, the fulfillment of the calling upon our life. And so there's another question. What's the calling on your life? What, what's the calling to minister for you? John knew he had a calling. And he knew what he was supposed to do. And he went and did it at the easiest or the most opportune place. I shouldn't say easiest, but the most opportune place for ministry to happen. So just a thought for us. To go do ministry where it's practical. All right, moving on. Verse 25 and 26. Interesting text here. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So we get this weird kind of information that happens here in verse 25. We understand that the religious people, the religious Jews of the day, are going specifically to John's disciples and starting a conversation about, it says their purification, or the ritual of purification, sort of the rite, which the purification and the washing was the baptism. So it seems like they're coming to these disciples Asking them about sort of their motive and what they're doing as they're baptizing. What's going on? We know John's baptism was to who? It was anyone. And the call was to repent and then to turn and be ready for Jesus. Be ready because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the Jews are coming up and they're, they're sort of familiar with this idea of someone getting baptized in repentance because they, at that period of time, would baptize a convert to Judaism into Judaism. So it's, it, they're familiar with the idea of it. What they're not familiar with is Jewish people being baptized into repentance. Because in their thinking, their mind's eye, it's like, wait a minute, we're Jews. We are the people of God. We're the ones. We don't need to repent. We're Jewish. Basically, a, a kind of thinking that used to be maybe more prevalent in our culture. I'm born in America. Of course I'm a Christian, right? Kind of idea. What are, you, what are you kidding me? I'm Jewish. Repent for what? I am the people of God. That's kind of their thinking, right? And so they're coming in and they start this. Now, we don't get any of the, the gist of that conversation or the argument. All we get is after those religious people come, somehow, I don't know how, Somehow, the attention was brought to another ministry down the river that was doing the same thing as this ministry. Of course, in my mind, I'm thinking that was no accident from the Jewish religious people, right? They're, they're, they're bringing the, John's disciples, they're bringing to attention what Jesus and his disciples were doing. And in my mind, a little downstream. I'm just going to use that phrase. I'm not exactly sure where it was in relation. I'm just going to use that phrase, a little downstream. And, and I would say, it seems that they're doing this on purpose. It seems that they're trying to throw a wrench in what John is doing and what his disciples were doing. And what their tactic is, is to get them to look at another ministry and to get upset or get in the flesh over the other ministry and what's happening in that other ministry. And... I would have to say this, for John's disciples, this seemed to be very effective because they got frustrated and they went straight to John and said, can you believe what this guy is doing down here? He's doing the same thing. Only, and look at what he says there, it's kind of interesting. They say, everyone's going to him, all the people, and their ministry's bigger, right? There's this frustration. Uh, they're stealing all of our people. I mean, it's what I'm getting. I'm re relaying for this. They're getting, they're Jesus is stealing all of our people. 
And so the enemy is getting them to take their eyes off of what their mission is and their calling is and put them on another ministry, another different group. And I, I, I look at this and I think about this and I go, man, I, I personally, I, I believe that this teaching is a great teaching for pastors. I don't, I, and, and the reason I say that is because I know a whole bunch of pastors and They've, they've told me that they can get jealous of other ministries. I'm being facetious. I know this because I'm a pastor, and it's easy to look at other ministries and get distracted and get drawn to something else and, and look at somebody else whose ministry is similar but different and successful in a different way or has a different property or a different building. It's just easy for us as human, as man, to be distracted, but we need to get our eyes back on the calling and the work that Jesus has put each of us to. It's interesting. I was, I was thinking about this as I'm going through the study. I had a meeting with a guy last week. And he informed me of two new church plants in Payson this year. And I'm thinking about it. And I'm just, in my mind, I, this probably isn't the spirit. It's probably my mind. But in my mind, I'm thinking, do you know how many churches are in Payson? Does anybody know? 42? I mean, there's like over 40 churches in Payson, Arizona. So in my mind, I'm thinking, why didn't you go to Winslow? (laughs) Or Holbrook? Or Joseph City? A place where there's not very many churches. You're going to come start another church. And the Lord has to go, hey, excuse me, remember whose servant you are? You're supposed to do what I'm calling you to do. And not look around and not wonder what other people are to do. And we're going to get to that here in just a second. I'm just saying it's easy to, uh, to get distracted. And any time that we wonder what's going on, in any case, we have to come back to our own calling. And John knew his own calling. He knew what his purpose was. He knew what he was supposed to be doing. And really, if I only want to be where God has called me to be, that is the best place for me to be. And I just have to say, personally, I love our church. And the church isn't the building. It's the body. It's the people in the church. But, of course, you know, in the flesh, there's always the doubts. There's always the fears. There's always the what-ifs. And even the complaints, all of those things need to be brought before Jesus and laid bare in the light of who he is and what he does. So, so now what we're going to get here is we're going to get basically four different word pictures slash answers on what we are supposed to be doing, who we are supposed to be, and who we're not supposed to be. And it's just a great section as we look at this. So it, it, it keeps us on the right track. And I put in my notes, it keeps us away from unhealthy thinking, but I, I'm going to take it a step further, sinful thinking. If we're thinking thoughts that aren't of the Lord, that's a sinful thing. So sin keeps us from sinful thinking. The first thing John says, verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. So the first answer we have here to those disciples, John acknowledges that. And in the context of, he's really talking about his ministry versus another ministry. <laughs> which I can't relate to that much because it's Jesus doing the ministry. Personally, if Jesus showed up in Payson and said, I'm starting a church, I would close this church and go follow Jesus. I'm just saying. (laughs) That's the logical deduction that we need. This is a different thing, but God has still called John to his ministry. But And we can even notice, we can even look back to when we first saw John, a couple of his disciples left and went after Jesus. And did he go, stop, what are you doing? Where are you going? I need your help. No. He was definitely okay with them following Jesus. And so this is John. John, man, we got such a good heart. So the first thing we see in the context of him doing ministry is, and really what John is saying is, that ministry was given to him by God. It's God's ministry. Man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. That is the truth. And understanding this is so important because when we truly realize, when we understand, then it's not really 
our, my ministry, my church. It's God's church. It's the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? It's the Lord who gives. It's the Lord who takes away. And since John's ministry was given to him by the Lord, it's the Lord's ministry. In other words, John's ministry isn't about John. It's about the calling of God on his life, which is to point people to Jesus. And it's just that fact. It is the Lord's ministry. And if it's the Lord's ministry, then I can go, thank you, Lord. It's up to you to do the work. It's up to you to add to the ministry whom you will. It's up to you how many people come or what the building looks like or the property looks like. It's up to you who's going to come and serve. It's up to you. Uh, Also, the other ministries in this town, they're up to you. And the servant is just to remain faithful to the calling and faithful to the Lord. Another thought is that if the ministry is given by God, the ministry or the opportunity, then what in the world are we doing trying to compare it to some other ministry? What good would that be? What good would that do? It's not to be compared to another ministry, but here's the thing. It's easy to look at the next guy's ministry and think, man, they're doing really good. What we need is smoke machines. Of course, I'm just being humorous, but you can fill in the blank. What we need is a darker, blacked-out sanctuary for the, those times of intimacy. What we need is, and you fill in the blank, and, and there's so many draws, and there's so many different things, but I'm so convinced what we need is the Word of God and the Spirit and the power of God. Well, other things, we don't need them. It's not a necessity. What we need is to look to Jesus and look to what God has given us to do and move forward in that. And even in this thought, in this context of ministry, we can take this to the individual and say the same, that a man can receive nothing, period, unless it is given by God, which gives us the opportunity to step back and look at our life and to think, take assessment. When's the last time you looked around and you just said, God, every good thing that you've given is from you, and I just acknowledge that. You Think about all the blessings, our family, our church body, all of the things that God has given that we're so blessed to have, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. And it's good just to stop and say, thank you, Jesus. The second thing John says here is verse 28. He says, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but have been sent before him. So John just tells them, guys, I already told you this. And basically what he's saying is, that's the Messiah. Are you kidding? We're comparing ministry to the Messiah? No. I already told you I'm not the Messiah, which brings up another amazing, interesting idea, something for us to kind of step back and think about is, well, what I'm not John knew what he was. I'm not the Messiah. It kind of goes back to one of the basic fundamental laws of theology. There is a God, and I'm not him. Number one rule, right? But you, you look at this, and, and, and John is, is, he knows also what he's not, which is something to, again, get us to step back and think about. God, what is my calling? What is your calling on my life? What's your directive for my life? I don't know, maybe get a piece of paper out and a pen this evening, this afternoon, and sit down and say, what is your calling on my life? If you already know it, then maybe say, God, what's not your calling on my life? What's a distraction that I'm allowing into my life from me stepping into, fully into that calling? And just think about that, because it's kind of what John is saying. I know what I'm not. And it's important, because the enemy wants to get in there and go, He wants to make me say something I say almost all the time. People go, how are you doing? I go, crazy. I'm just doing so much. There's so many things on my plate. I don't even, a lot of times these days go by and I go, what day is it? I don't even know what's going on. Because 
It's absolutely nuts. And I think part of that is a distraction of our modern culture, and it's from the enemy. To put down all those things and sit with the Lord is of utmost importance. But to just to get you to think, to get me to stop, to think, what is it that I'm being too busy with that I could say no to in order to say yes to what you have for my life? And, and let me just say this. Your calling is specific to you. You don't have to be the pastor of the church. The calling is different for each and every one of us. And the calling could be as simple as a tradesman. And there are people that you're working around that need, it's so important for them to see you being a Christian in your context, in whatever trade you're in. They don't have Christ. You're the only Jesus they're going to see, or whatever it is. But it's so important for us to step into that calling. So important. Then he continues on in this next example, kind of analogy in verse 29. He says, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. So he gives this other example. And in this example itself, really is John revealing to us one thing right off the bat, that Jesus is God, simply because in the Old Testament, God was depicted as the husband and Israel as the wife. So this picture is something relatable to them. They already had this picture in their mind. And John reveals to his disciples who he is in the, in the picture of this. He's a friend of the bridegroom. Which is interesting. And in this, I look at this and I think, man, this is something that's, it shows the humility of John. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, I'm the best man. I mean, he could have. Jesus said he was among the prophets, the greatest prophet, pointing to him, his, his role that he stepped into, absolutely amazing ministry of repentance and baptizing thousands of people to follow Christ. But he didn't say, I'm the, I'm the best man. He didn't even say, I'm a groomsman. In fact, when I, when, I, when I really think about this, I think, you know what John wasn't concerned about? His title. He was concerned about pointing people to who Jesus is, not he is. Man, what an awesome heart of John. So he doesn't mention that. He just says, I'm just the friend of the bridegroom. And I rejoice to hear the bridegroom's voice. And that in itself, I, I, I want you to look back really quick. Look at what John says. He says in here that he rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. Question. Where are you trying to get joy in your life? Because John's telling us an answer. If you listen and hear the voice of Jesus, it will fulfill your joy. It's so simple. Just to hear the voice of Jesus will fulfill my joy. I think some of us are looking for joy in the wrong place. Because what this speaks to me, I need to look for joy in my quiet time alone with him. That's the source. That's what I need. That's the fulfillment of joy in my life. And of course, how do we hear from Jesus? Well, we want to hear his voice, but we also look at the word, of course. We look to the word to hear the voice of Jesus speaking to us. And also, to sit in a place, I like to call it silence and solitude, to just be alone in the quiet and sit with him. It's what this relationship is about, to hear the voice and to be fulfilled. Some good words from John. Also, John seems to understand that they're all on the same team. This is an interesting thing to think about, interesting picture to think about, that we are all on the same team, and all of the churches that are Bible-believing churches in our town, we're all on the same team. It's a shame when we get to like odds with one another or trying to outdo one another instead of saying, 
Man, are you kidding me? When people come to Christ at Mountain Bible, that's scoreboard points on the board of Jesus, right? It's points scored for our team. Praise God. And we can rejoice over that. Or when someone comes to the Lord at Ponderosa or at the Star Valley Church or wherever they're from, that we would go, yes, we're on the same team. And I just think, how appropriate Pete's praise report. Getting to go share at Ponderosa. Points on the Jesus scoreboard, right? I'm just so thankful for that and that we would, we would have that mindset because... I'm just absolutely convinced that when we get to heaven, we're not going to be sitting in different sections. <laughs> we're the body of Christ, for goodness sake. We're on the same team. So John, then he goes on to make, it's the shortest verse in this section, but his most famous verse probably of all. Verse 30. John says, he must increase but I must decrease. Man, I love John. Man, I love this heart. This is the truth for every individual. And this is the truth for every ministry. It's the need for every ministry. Of course, John is, in the context, he's talking about a ministry that's going on. And he says, in this ministry, he must increase and I must decrease. You know what I think, too? I think, too, the Jesus Revolution movie. You guys seen that one? And what did they do when people were coming to Christ? No man took credit. Jesus. It's all him. It's all for him. It's all by him. It's Jesus. And this has got to be the truth in every ministry, especially upfront ministry, especially pastors, especially worship leaders, because the temptation is to do the opposite. The temptation is to bring sort of attention to yourself other than Jesus. The temptation is to do that, and listen, to do that is the worst thing we could do. Because let me just tell you something. People don't need me. They need Jesus. And people don't need you. They need Jesus. Now, when I, th- when I hear this, when I, when I look at what John says here, I, I, I think that people in ministry, they, they start to get the mindset to say, well, no, because I want our ministry to grow. And sometimes we'll get the, the, the wrong kind of thinking that says, if I can bring more attention to me, then the ministry will grow. And I would have to say that's the wrong thinking, although that, that kind of is a secular worldly thinking right? A secular worldly thinking that would, would say this is a, f- a form for uh, increasing your church growth, which really it's not about that at all. It's about doing the calling that Jesus has called. And so the business model would be, no, we need to increase so that we can increase. The truth of Jesus is, no, we need to decrease and he needs to increase. And, and let me just say this, it, it goes against like our fleshly thinking. It goes, what? I have to decrease? No. And our little flesh is in there going, I I can't do that. But I want to bring uh, your attention to this truth of Christianity, truth of walking to Jesus, that for me to decrease and him to increase is going to allow us to step into becoming who we really are in Christ. Our flesh wants to say, no, I need to increase too. We'll both increase, Jesus. That's not what we need. We need to decrease. And we need to step into what he's calling into that place. And it is the fulfillment of God's will. You know, he saved you for a few reasons. And one of them is to be transformed into the image of Jesus. Now I think about Jesus' life. I think about the glory of God. In the beginning was the word. And the power that he used to create, that he spoke. And then I think about him coming in the flesh, being born a baby. And then I think about his life and his ministry. What was he known for? He was known for his limousine. He was known for his glorious house that he lived in, his mansion, 
for being untouchable. Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, came and he served. He put on the towel of a servant and washed the feet of his disciples. God did this. Who am I to think I must increase and he must increase? Man, can we step out of that and into this? And I just have to say one more time, thank you, Lord, for John. Thank you for his heart. Thank you for his example. Thank you for these words. He must increase and I must decrease. And then we close with this last section. We're going to break it into a couple of parts here. Verse 31. It says, He who comes from above is above all. And he who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testified. And no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. Interesting. First thing we see here is that over and over, in a repetitive way, John is saying, Jesus is not from here, he's from heaven. He's from above. Jesus, and it's, it kind of flies right into, or fits right into, I should say, the context of the overarching theme of the Gospel of John, which is to reveal Jesus as who? God. And so John, this fits right in. He's from above. He's above all. He's from heaven. And so what he has heard and what he has seen, he testifies. John is telling his disciples, listen to his words, because when you hear his word, you hear God. You hear God's word, a good word for us. The world tries to say Jesus is so many things, but he's not God. John is saying he's God. Listen to him. But notice what he says here. That he comes from above. He's seen and heard what he testifies. And then something interesting, John says, and no one receives his testimony. And I, I, I hear that and I think to myself, well, people do receive his testimony. But what's going on here, John? And really, I think it's his heart to say, everyone should be receiving Jesus. And compared to what should happen, there's hardly anybody. Because Jesus is the answer. He's the Messiah, and he's relaying that to them. Everyone should receive his testimony. And then the, what, he says something else that's so amazing. I love this little nugget in here, that he who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. In other words, authenticated. So nobody's really believing, but when you believe you're authenticating, you're certifying that God is true. And I love this thought. I'm thinking a couple of things. Who are we certifying this to? Who is seeing the testimony of our authentication, if you will, of Christ being true and God being true? Well, there's a couple. And I would have to say this right off the bat. I think of God the Father and how pleased God the Father is to see people come to his Son. That certification, ah, yes, they're getting it. They believe in my son and what he did at the cross. But then secondly, when we walk in faith and trust the Lord, we're the, we're the certificate of authenticity to the world around us that God is true. They're seeing it in your life walked out. Man, that guy it's full of light and weirdness and love, and I don't know quite what it is. I can't put my finger right on it, but it's testifying to something inside of me. And the fact of the matter is, it's that God is true. And we can each be that. How amazing is that? You guys are a bunch of certificated people walking around, and I hope you are. I pray that our light so shines in this dark world. Amen? So then John says, he's moving on in verse 34. He says, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. Interesting here. And, and in my mind, uh, verse 34 rev reverts right back to like what we've been talking about. John chapter 1. He speaks the words of God. And in John chapter 1, remember, in the beginning was the word 
and the word was with God, and the word was God, and now down to verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is just saying, this is what's happening. When he speaks, it's God's word. And then, the second half of that, uh, uh, interesting, John gives us some information. He says, for God does not give the spirit by measure. That's an interesting thought. He's basically saying, God doesn't give you a little bit of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't give you just some. Either the door's open to the Spirit or the door's closed to the Spirit. It's kind of like all or nothing in the Spirit. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that thought here in a minute. But, but let's continue on. Let's close up here. Verse 35, he says, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. And he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So we get some more interesting information. 35, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. It reminds me of a book we went through not too long ago, Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to read you a little section of chapter 1, verse starting in verse 16. It says, by him all things were created that are in heaven and are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. The Father has given all things into the hand of his Son. It's who Jesus is. And now he says in verse 36, And he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, I think it's easy for people, for any human basically, to look at that and go, I love the life part, I hate the death part. Right? I look at that and I go, man, this is so heavy. Do you really have to say you shall not see life and the wrath of God will be on you? And the, the fact of the matter is, yes, that needs to be said. And I just want to remind you of something. Before you go, man, see, I knew it. God's just waiting. He just wants to smite. He's a smiter. He's waiting for someone to mess up so he can smite him. And I don't know why he said, but it's probably because I'm thinking of my daughter. My daughter, Hallie, she's almost a year old. And yesterday, she was chasing this little teeny ant in the living room. She was trying to poke it. I'm thinking, that's a smiter. She was trying (laughs) to smite. Look, this is not God. God's not waiting for an opportunity to smite people. God is looking for an opportunity that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. He's looking for an opportunity for you to receive the gospel. And so I have to bring this fact, this this truth of Christianity, this truth of theology. And this is the truth. The righteous judgment for sin... Another word for the wrath of God. The righteous judgment for sin must be paid for. There's two options. The one who sins pays the the price in death. Or the pure, innocent lamb of God pays the price in death. The choice is up to you. This is the truth. He came not to condemn the world, but so that the world through him might be saved. And so here it is. The choice is mine. The choice is yours. I want to mention one more thing before we go into wrapping it up, and that is this, from the whole of chapter 3. So this kind of ties the whole of chapter 3 together. From the whole of chapter 3, there are three musts in this chapter. So we're going to look back and just wrap these up. And I'm going to ask Beth to come up if she's available as we close out this morning. 
the three musts. The first one's from chapter, it's from verse three, but it's kind of concluded the thought in verse seven. And it's this, you must be born again. The first must, you must be born again. The second one is from verse 14. And that is this, as the bronze serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. In order for us, to have salvation. We must be born again, and Jesus must die so that we could look to that cross in faith and believe in him. And the last one is for us walking in the Lord. It's for us that have chosen to follow Jesus, and we just looked at it in verse 30. He must increase, and I must decrease. And all of them, I just pray right now, God, by by your grace and your goodness and your faithfulness, may we be walking in all of these, Lord. That we would not allow these musts to be undone in our hearts. It's the only way. We're going to see here later on in the Gospel of John, Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, And the life, no one comes to the Father except by me. And as we're looking at him, as we're beholding Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, I pray that the Spirit is testifying that is true in your life. And I must decrease and he must increase. Now I'm going to go back to this idea that John says, For God does not give the Spirit by measure. There's another necessity in the life of the believer. And it comes with the first must. You must be born again. And that is this. You must be born from above by the Spirit of God. John said Jesus, he baptized with water, but one would come who would baptize with fire. This is the Spirit of God. This is what John is talking about here. That he doesn't give the Spirit of God by measure. You either have access, full access to the Spirit of God or you don't. There's only one way to get that access. Only one way. Start being better. It's the wrong answer. There's only one way to get the access to the Spirit of God, and it's by standing before that cross and saying, I am dirty. I am not a fit place, dwelling place for the Spirit of God. I need the cleansing power of the blood of the Lamb of God to make me clean, to make this vessel pure so that God himself can live in me. And here is the craziest thing about Christianity is that God lives in you. The biggest difference of all the other religions, God lives in you. You are his dwelling place. So the question for me is to step back and say, is the spirit of God evident in my life? And I want you to ask the same question. Is the spirit of God evident in my life? Or is there a question mark? Is it like, I I don't know, maybe. It's a necessity. And so I want to ask or encourage you this morning to come to God by the blood and ask for that newness of life. Ask for that spirit in your life. I don't care if you've done it before. I'm going to say, do it again. That we would ask. And you know, Jesus said, speaking of his Father and the Holy Spirit, you, being bad fathers, give good gifts to your son. How much more will he give the spirit to those who ask him? So if you guys, if you want the spirit of God and you're with me on this this page, this journey, would you stand with me? And would you just put your hands, palms open, palms up. And Jesus, I thank you that you have overseen and overheard this time this morning. And God, that you are very keenly aware of the hearts of your sheep. God, you see our want and our desire for you in our lives and you see our need. 
And it's your good pleasure to meet that need as the best father we've ever had to give us that gift. Lord, in opening our hands, we're letting go of sin. We're letting go of things that would hinder us from the spirit in our life. And with open arms, we're saying, yes, Jesus, I need that blood and I want your spirit. And so, Lord, we ask for your spirit, but we're not going to just do it like that. We are going to say, Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead of the Trinity, Holy Spirit, come live in us. Fill us, Lord. God, and I thank you that your word says that you don't give in measure. We want the whole thing, Lord. We want all of you. God, we want you to increase and us to decrease. Thank you that you see us, Lord. Thank you that you meet us. And in faith, we believe and trust that you have given your spirit, that you are here moving in our lives. Thank you, God. Thank you for the precious blood that makes this possible. We praise you, God. We worship you, Lord. Yes, God, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your provision, God. I thank you for this body of Christ, this family that is our church, Lord, for the open hearts. And we trust your word and we trust your faithfulness and your goodness, Lord. We trust that you have, Spirit, come into our lives. Lord, help us to walk in this life. Lord, help us to continue on this path. We need you, Lord. We desire you. We want you. Take these hands, Lord. May they be used of you. Lord, take our feet. God, may we go where you want us to be. Lord, may we live this life, this exciting, amazing adventure of following you. We praise you this morning. We thank you. All that we get, all that we receive is in Christ's name, and it's in your name we pray. God's children said, amen. Amen. God bless you guys.